Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. So turn there if you would. Beginning with verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from his work which God created and made. You can see what the emphasis is. God's done. God's done at least with this segment. When I was in school at Bob Jones University, uh, Dr. Bob Sr., the founder, was uh, famous for sayings, a like Christian philosopher. And in every classroom, there would be one of his chapel sayings posted right up over the blackboard. And one of them that I was in, and he emphasized constantly was simply the words, finish the job, finish the job. It perhaps became his most famous chapel saying, simple eloquence, just finish the job. Well, a long time later, a guy came along with the name of Larry the Cable Guy. And with eloquent hillbilly ease, he said basically the same thing. Get her done. Get her done. And God got it done. But the question is, he got it done perfectly as he does everything. How did it get to this mess that we're in today? If it was so perfect to start with. Uh, you might uh, recognize this trio over here on your right and my left. Who are they? Amos and Andy. Amos and Andy. And the star of the show was a guy by the name of the Kingfish. One was a practical, very intelligent guy, but he was a cabbie. He's on uh, the left. And then there's Andy Brown, who was kind of the guy that everything had to be explained to. And there in the middle is the kingfish. He is the schemer that always got them into trouble. And I remember in one segment, by the way, they were much funnier than Laurel and Hardy. They were hilarious. But they were a little bit politically incorrect, so uh, you don't see reruns of them today. Where Andy Brown asked the kingfish and says, what is this status quo you keep talking about? And the kingfish says, well, uh, that is the Latin for this mess we is in. How did we get to the status quo, the mess we are in? And we're gonna see today exactly how that happened. All right, last session we completed God's work week. That brought us to chapter two of Genesis. And the emphasis is on what is called the Sabbath. The Sabbath, verses one through three. Now evidently the recreation of Genesis one, two included the heavens, the earth, and perhaps the angels, where they are often called the host. God, after six days, was finished with the task of creation, but not finished with all of his work. What else did he finish? Well, he later finished the work of redemption. That would be John 19. He later finished the canon. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. He finished man's opportunity to alter his eternity. Revelation 22, 11. He finished the prophetic timetable, all those things that were predicted and laid out in the Old Testament. It was done that it might be fulfilled and they were all fulfilled. 
He is a finisher. He finishes the job. Now the deists say he's a master clockwinder. He just wound it up and then took an eternal siesta. That is not the case. He has not only wound the thing up, but he is a master clock watcher, Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of the time was come, he sent his son. All right, the key word in verse two is rested. He rested. What did he do when he was done? He rested. And the idea is not exhaustion or the need of some kind of physical or personal restoration. I think we have the picture up here of the Ozark country in Missouri, the Ozarks. And the Ozarks are famous for a lot of things. And over here on this side of it, you see what is called Old Matt's Cabin. The book, The Shepherd of the Hills, at one time was the second most published book in America for years, only exceeded by the Bible. And this is the Shepherd of the Hills country. And old Matt was a preacher. He was a preacher from Chicago who came down in the summertime on his vacation to take up residence and write his sermons. Many preachers did that. They got about a three month vacation and Northern Michigan was a very popular site for them to go to. And this story of the Shepherd of the Hills takes place in the Ozarks during his vacation, old Matt. He was resting, a little bit of R&R. &R. Harold Bell Wright was the author, by the way. And I remember having to take folks to Old Matt's cabin and they had a play, an outdoor play there. And everybody that came to Missouri wanted to go to Branson, listen to a hillbilly show or two, and then see this outdoor play. It seat about 3,000 at the time and it was filled up every night. And I remember one part of the play because the narrator, I, I was there so many times I practically memorized the thing. The narrator said, God, when he got done with these Ozark mountains, it was such a task that he was plumb tuckered out. And therefore he had to sit down and rest a while. Well, that's not the idea. He rested in the sense that he stopped, just like something comes to rest, like something that is moving. He is not moving anymore, but he wasn't tired. There are many false forms of worship and a lot of bad theology, and that would be one of them. It's a principle if not of theology, that there is a rest day. Now in the Old Testament it was. You couldn't do certain things on the rest day. Today that's stretching scripture a bit to say that there are things that you just can't do on Sunday. Although you probably, if you're older, were reared in that conviction that this was a special day, it was a rest day, you just have to sit down and rest. You can't do anything. You can't work, can't do anything. I could tell you stories that would blow your mind. I got in huge trouble one time for throwing a ball up against the side of a building and then catching it and throwing it again and catching it. My grandfather taught me we didn't do that. My mother tells a story of on Sunday night, they didn't do anything after church, but just go home and sit and converse. They could do that. Then at 12.01, they broke out the Parcheesi games and the easy money and began to play. But they couldn't do it until after midnight. I went to Bob Jones and was in a theology class and a professor answered the question, what about this Sunday thing? And he said, you can do anything on Sunday, you can do any other day. And I thought, heresy, where have I come? I learned he was right. You can do anything on Sunday, you can do any other day, as long as you're not interfering with what your church is doing. But we have taken that license in runaways. 
And now it's anything can interfere with it. It's fine, doesn't make any difference. A little extra money, I'll, I'll put in for that extra double time or whatever it is, time and a half. I'll run off and have seven vacations. Doesn't matter if I miss on Sunday or not. We've taken it and we've kind of run wild with it. The Lord rested, finished, was satisfied to enjoy fellowship with his new creature. He wants to enjoy fellowship with his creatures today. That's part of what he wants to do. It didn't take long, however, for the creatures to fracture the one rule they had. And that would cause God to have to get working again. This time on an altered plan, a creative act, all right. It's a creative act of redemption. He had to reclaim, reclamation. He had to reclaim that creature who had messed up and not followed his one rule. Suppose I turn my house over to you and said, okay, I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to do everything for it. I'm going to keep the refrigerator stocked. I'm going to do everything you need to enjoy my house while I'm gone. But there's one hall closet back there. I'm going to store my valuables. And I want you to stay out of that. Don't get in that closet. You can have the rest of the house. Attic, basement, everything. And then I leave. Perverse human nature, what is it going to say to itself? Why is he keeping me out of that closet? I wonder what he's got in there he doesn't want me to see. And you might be tempted to just try to somehow open that door and get a sneak peek of what is in there and maybe sample the wares of what is in there. That's man. That's man. It's called the fall. And brother, it was a big fall and we are all involved. I am wearing these glasses because of the fall. Everything would have been perfect. Nothing is perfect because of the fall. That blasted Adam and his blasted wife. You got an itch somewhere, a little bit uncomfortable? The fall. It's Adam's fault. It was perfect. And then verses 4 through 7 is the summary. The generations of the heavens and the earth. Now it's ignorance of the generations, the successive eras, that causes folks to mess up today in interpreting the Bible. Generations from genes and generic and genesis and genocide. Most of the problems in modern education is a misunderstanding of the generations, the successive eras of earth. The laws, the rules, the economy, the dispensationalism. And if you don't know that word, it's a very key word, learn it. It's a Bible word even, dispensations, dispensationalism. In verse five, for instance, the original hydrological system, the cycle was different than it is today. There's a lot of things that are different. Morris, Henry Morris, I think we have his picture up there, or Will. Morris and Whitcomb, his collaborator in the book, The Genesis Flood, have taught that prior to the flood, there was a canopy over the earth. Now the problem with that is, and there may have been, but it says that this mist came up from the earth. And this canopy during the time of the universal flood came crashing down and it changed the order of things dramatically. It's a good book. It's a book everybody should read whether every one of his principles is right or not. But prior to the flood, there were global air mass movements that were different. After the flood, there was decay from the sun's rays not being filtered by this canopy. Perhaps at this time, because of the flood and the disruption on Earth, the Earth tilted 23 and a half degrees on its axis. Solar changes resulted. A hot house temperature before the flood of 7 to 75, 70 to 75 degrees. Now it became more variable and seasonable and, and varied all over the Earth. More extreme. Ecclesiastes 1, 6 and 7, Isaiah 55, 10 and 11, Job 28, 24 through 26 and several more 
that I won't take time going through. And don't worry, when I go lickety-split through these, because I have to, because of the time allotted, don't worry about you're not going to be quizzed or tested on exactly what the individual verses say, so don't worry about that. It's described in 2 Peter 3 as the world that then was. There is a world which is now, and there is a world that then was. And with it gone, with the world that then was gone, we have a different system. We have a different hydro, uh, hydrological system. The water is different when it was delivered to the continents. The atmospheric circulation and condensation principle, rain and snow, they're different. Transportation back to the ocean via waterways, rivers, streams, springs, was now different and in vogue. Another possibility is the gap theory and recreation. It was recreated this way. Verse five, if the mist caused the plants to live but not grow until man arrived, the earlier days of Genesis would not be extended periods, would they? They would be literal 24 hour periods as true fundamentalists normally believe. A different geochronology, as it is called. Geochronology, fancy word, just, just means things were different in the cycle of the water. Now, can this be proved? Uranium eventually breaks down, and I'm no scientist, but I can read, Uranium eventually breaks down to lead and helium, which are stable elements. One 637th part of uranium will turn to lead in 10 million years. Let me repeat it. One 637th part of uranium will turn to lead in 10 million years. The oldest example that has ever been found on earth, and they believe that it is the oldest example, is found in Ignatius Rock. And if you assume the truth of uniformitarianism, which virtually all evolutionists do, 98% of scientists do, uniformitarianism, things are the same now as they always have been. It hasn't changed. And discounting their admitted 10% error, we won't even try to factor that. The oldest the earth could be, the oldest the earth could be scientifically is 1,800,000 years. 1,800,000 years. You say, yeah, doc, but that's a long time, 1,800,000 years, and I would say not long enough to do what they want it to do. Estimates of the Mesozoic era range from, big bang apologists here, 60 million to 520 million years. Two billion to 40 billion years to get from amoeba to man. That's what they estimate. Earth's not that old, folks. It can't be get all the way from amoeba to Pablo Picasso in that amount of time, you can't do it. And taking their figure, two billion, their hypothesis, it is outstripped the reality of, of the earth by 99.5%. Yet science in general and the fact of evolution in particular are the twin gods of the 21st century American really smart folks, the evolutionists. And because it, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't even fit their own models, the Bible is called a compendium of fables. They conclude there is no hell because they don't want there to be a hell. Sin is a psychological hang-up. And uh, Brett told me a story the other day about uh, a movement even in theological circles, more liberal theological circles, 
to eliminate the word sin. Call it a dysfunction or call it what you want, you know, a temporary sidetrack, anything you want, but don't call it sin anymore. The problem is the Bible calls it sin in too many places. So what are you going to do? It's a psychological hang up. It causes them to conclude that when it's over, it's over. There's no afterlife. Thus, we can all just cut loose and live like Cretans. After all, you only go around once anyway, then you're dead like a dog. So don't let the fundamentalists dampen your fun because it's not true. There's a grammatical controversy in here that I'm not going to take time to go over too much, but it involves the names of God. And we've covered that a little bit in the JEPD theory, the composite authorship it's called the redactor integration error. Don't you love it? Don't you love the language? And you break it down and they purposely don't want to break it down. It's really very simple. Composite authorship just means more than one. And they're fit together. Redactor integration. That's a guy who puts them together. That's sticking these different documents together. That's all it means. But it sure sounds good. One has said they just as easily could have called them Mighty Mouse, Superman, Batman, and some comic figure. Captain Marvel, maybe. Infidels love to invent fancy words. Words that confuse the poor ignorant masses that haven't had their opportunity at education. And they say, give us five or six years of your time, 150 to $300,000 worth of your sweat equity, and you can be almost as smart as we are because you've learned our words, our words to the different disciplines. All right, Genesis 2, 8 through 14. I'm not going to take time to read it, but it's up there, so read it. It is an introductory overview before an in-depth study of six verses. It does, however, beautifully set the scene for some valuable insights. First of all, man was created prior to his special habitation. Man's there. God says, well, I want to make a special place for him. And God does. And this special place is somewhere west of the garden where man is, and perhaps west of Eden itself. And do they speculate? Some of them even come up with America. You say, well, how would they get across the ocean? There wasn't an ocean yet. Did you ever take a look at the map? And, and Henry Morris does this, and David Heiser does it, and you've met him in the last few weeks. And he put up a map to show how the continents at one time fit together. And you look at that thing, and they do. If you just move them over a little bit, they just neatly kind of all fit together. Why is that? Because they were once together. And something happened to split them apart. Well, what is that? The Great Flood. But we'll get to that. That's a few chapters up. It would also have been apparent that there is a debt that man owes to God particularly Adam. God was the one that made him. God was the one that taught him. God is the one that came and communed with him and was now giving him man's recurrent dream of a tropical paradise island as his habitation. If you could retire anywhere you wanted to, where would it be? Have you ever thought about that? Now, I've had the opportunity just because traveling around preaching in previous years to visit a lot of different sites. And I've often thought, oh, I'd hate to live here. I preached in Gary, Indiana once. If you're from there, I'm sorry. A hole, smelly, terrible. I felt sorry for the people living in Gary, Indiana and Hammond and some of these places. But I've been to other places where I've said, you know, man, it wouldn't be bad to live here. I just visited uh, Bailey a few weeks ago and we took her to school. 
Pensacola would be a Pensacola Beach, man. Whew. San Diego. I've been there and preached there. San Diego. It was 73 or 4 degrees every day. I had a preacher tell me one time, if I ever got a call to a possible church in San Diego, I'd tell my wife, go up and pack while I pray about it. <laughs> Beautiful place. And of course, there are places like that all over. Places I wouldn't want to go. I've never been colder than when I was in Bangor, Maine in February. All right, you get the idea. This place, however, was perfect. Eden. And the garden is going to be eastward in Eden. Well, what is Eden? Don't just call it the Garden of Eden. It's eastward in Eden. And Eden is a basic triangle about a thousand miles up the side. So it's not, not some little backyard something it must have been something consider Adam's situation his antediluvian self he was living in a 72 to 76 degree hothouse temperature without rain remember it didn't rain then without snow without decay without death the thing was so good that even God was impressed with his own work and he looked at it and said, man, this is very good. I've done a good job this time. It is very good. God doesn't exaggerate. It was nice there. But evidently not good enough for his special creature. So he cordoned off a special triangle, Eden, which means delight, by the way, that's still not good enough for Adam. He wants to dote on Adam. So he personally planted a garden. Size unknown. For Adam to live in. Next, the great horticulturalist that he was, he planted and pruned and, and nurtured flora and fauna of every kind, laden with produce. Trees dripping with luscious, ever ripening, no decay, remember. Melons, grapes, oranges, apples, pears, cherries, lemons, limes, etc. You think you could handle that? You think you could, you could do that? And keep the one little rule that God gave? Or would you want to get in that whole closet? Just so badly that you're willing to risk it all. Now among the flora and fauna were two special trees with tremendous import for the destiny of mankind. The centerpiece of the opulence of Eden was the tree of life. It's a literal tree, not just a symbol of something as is often taught. There's no contextual indication at all that it was symbolism. There was something resident in the fruit that when eaten would cause your body to change, would abate the process. Genesis 3.22, tree of life. And this tree will be growing in profusion in the new Jerusalem, Revelation 22.2. And it is said to be for the health of the nations. Man dreams of a garden existence. Well, he had one. Man dreams of sustenance without backbreaking toil. He had it. Man dreams of the elixir of life, a fountain of youth, Ponzi. And guess what? He had it. Here it is. Man dreams of the company of the perfect woman. My brother, when he was younger, dating around all that, I would say, well, Larry, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? He said, a Christian Venus. I'm looking for a Christian Venus. Now, I'm not going to get into whether he found one or not. I don't want to start a family fight. Well, this perfect woman is going to show up shortly. And he'll just have it made if he can leave that one thing alone. If he doesn't monkey up the works. Maybe that's the clue to evolution, monkey to man.
Actually, it was man to monkey. He monkeyed up the works. He got us from perfection down to our now more corrupted state. Pastor has two rules. If you want to fail in the pastorate, you're going to break these rules. You know what they are. Money and women. Money and women. And that has caused more these guys to leave the pastorate than any other thing. How would you like to not age? That was also true in the garden. Everybody's looking to anti-aging. I turn on the TV all the time. You take this and rub this into your skin and you'll look 40 years younger. Modern science has developed a field of study called gerontology, the study of the aging process. And they're hoping to devise a process or chemical reaction to arrest aging, retard it. And they think that about 140 years is the outside limit before things just really start to fall apart and you can't do anything about it. But if they could just get a handle on a few things, 140, that might be possible. I'm told that if you reach 55 in reasonable health, 55, you'll probably hit, if you're a man, about 85, and a woman, almost 90. The average now is about five years under that. They're now so successful that insurance companies and government agencies such as Medicare and Social Security are threatened with insolvency. That is largely because medical science is making some breakthroughs and it's extending life and it doesn't take the extension to be too great before the systems that we've devised just fall flat. What are we gonna do about them? That's all in the political process right now. Single payer. So everybody can be, you can't afford it. You can't fund it, except for one way. When you get to be 70, you can't have access to these procedures anymore, and 80, you can't have access to these procedures, so you just die. That's the only way to afford it. Next, we move to tree number two, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This one was also striking because it had a luscious load, Genesis 3, 6. It would create the evolutionary nirvana, God's status nearly, living continually. God didn't want you to have that possibility as yet. He's gonna give you the possibility later on to live continually, but not yet. And do you know in the book of the Revelation, that group that didn't accept Christ and goes off into eternity, they have a different body than you're gonna have. And they're gonna to have to have access, according to Revelation, to a tree that produces fruit in order to cause them to potentially live forever too. But they have to have access to the tree or they won't make it. It has been conjectured that this fruit contained a toxic element that when ingested created an imbalance in the blood or genetic code that was capable of either destroying or saving. And if you don't get it, or if you take it in this case of this tree, you get a kind of a slow acting AIDS. You get things wrong with you you get death, which is a tragedy. To experience death is not gonna benefit you. She thought it would, it'll benefit her. It'll make you like God, you'll be God's. And that meanie God, he doesn't want you to get access to that because he doesn't want you to be as good as he is. And she bought it. Did the man buy it? Not according to the New Testament. He didn't buy it, but he took it anyway. And the suggestion is that he loved this woman so much that knowing it would kill him, he still took it, 
in full knowledge of what the end result would be. It's a permanent experience, this thing called death. And whoever has bought the farm to try this tree one time, they're dead. And anyone who springs from their loins with the same genetic recoding is likewise dead. You experienced, you got recoded through Adam. He's your federal head. You're going to die. It's appointed unto man once to die. Happily, one experience, one partaking of the serum of innocence, innocent blood from another tree, 1 Peter 2.24, will find the effects are, ir are reversible. And they can then ingest something, the blood of Christ, that will cause them to live forever and undo this thing. Oh, I'm going to have to skip some material here which I will do on trees. Very interesting. Arthur Pink, by the way, in his book on Genesis, has an, an excellent work up of some of this. You might want to get that. I'm speeding ahead here. All right, verses 10 through 14. Hint at the geography and ecosystem of Eden. The geography and ecosystem of Eden. The lush produce, even if the garden proper was relatively diminutive in size, would dictate a thriving water supply system. Beyond the diurnal mist disgust that covered the earth and caused the plants to survive. Do you ever notice you go to a greenhouse that they, they mist rather than just pour water in? Every once in a while something comes on and just fine mist because they don't want it to grow like crazy, but they want it to live. God had a superior system even to that, but it was a mist. It maintained a high enough water table to feed the root system of the extant vegetation. Henry Morris. Now Henry Morris, is he up there? Try to find Henry for me. There he is. I've crossed paths with him several times through the years, and he wouldn't know me from Adam, since we're studying Genesis. Uh, but I, I've discussed some things with him. He was on a trip with me one time over to London, got to talk to him on a bus ride. I initially met him, I think I told you, at Bob Jones University when he visited for the first time and busted out his theory of a young earth that everybody almost believes now. I won't say I do, but a lot of folks do. His doctorate is in hydrostatics. So he not only discusses evolution, but when it involves water, he is the expert in the world, or was. He just died fairly recently. And he says that there was a whole different system. And after the flood, you have this system of evaporation. You have this system that is vertical. The water goes up, the water comes down. He said it was horizontal before the flood. That is, it just circulated on the earth and didn't go up and down. I'll spare you the analysis here, but it's in his book, The Genesis Flood, on pages 88 and 89, if you'd like to get it. How many of you, by the way, ordered the other book that I recommended? Okay, several of you. I think you've triggered something. It's more expensive now. I mean, I'm sure this book was in a dusty back room somewhere, and suddenly they get about six or eight orders, and the price triples just in a few weeks. So congratulations, folks. You drove up the price. Now, to prove that this was no wandering, idyllic little stream that the Bible is talking about here that went through the garden, the Bible mentions four arteries, four major arteries that proved major sources of water on the earth at this time. 
and they emptied into different segments of the antediluvian world, thus completing or restarting the cycle. Completing the old cycle, restarting the new. There's a map up there. All right, take a look at it. The four are, if you have your Bibles open or you have your notes out, the Pison, the Gihon, the Heidekel, and the Euphrates. The Heidekel is also called the Tigris. The Tigris and the Euphrates are on the map today if you want to locate them. They know exactly where they were. Now they may be in a little bit different place. They know where they are, I should say. They, they may be in a little different place after the flood because one of them appears on one side and after the flood on the other. But it is an interesting study. By the way, in Desert Storm, we bombed bridges and everything that was near the Euphrates because it's still a, a key river today. The best guess for the Gihon is the Nile. It was the Nile River, or turned into that. And the Pison, the Ganges, or the Indus. And some feel that the flood so altered the topography of Earth that there's little relation between the rivers where they were and where they are now, their, their counterparts. However, the folks that came out of the flood and told the stories and the tradition started, remembered the names. And so they kept the names the same because they, they were in their experience. And we do the same thing. New York, what is that? Well, that's a name for old York, but they wanted to put it over here. New Amsterdam, New London, New England. The garden itself would have been affected by the curse. You say, well, let's search and find the Garden of Eden and we can live there again. Well, no, you can't. You see, there was a curse that came after. The ground was cursed. And uh, thorns and things of that sort cropped up. And with a few short years gone by, I'm sure the garden blended with the surrounding landscape. And you couldn't find or care to find the Garden of Eden. It may be terrible today. It may be one of the worst spots on earth today. Don't try to live there. Whatever vestiges of glory that remain would have been swept into oblivion by the universal floodgates of God's judgment waters. I find it interesting in here I have a very little bit of gold, all right? I have just enough to say, I've got more gold than is in my teeth, but not much, not much. Gold is mentioned in here. Are you a gold bug? Do you follow gold on the stock exchange? Gold and silver? Well, I do. Whether you do or not, it's interesting. You want gold? Go to a place called Havilah. Havilah in your Bible. The best guess that I've come up with after reviewing all of these folks that are writing on the subject is that Havilah is on the African continent. Havilah, there's gold there. Where exactly? We don't know, but we do know there's a lot of gold in Africa. It's one of the most prolific spots on earth for mining gold. See for reference Genesis 10 verse 7 where a son of Cush, a descendant of Ham, is given the name. And by the way, did you read where it's South African gold? They predict, at least if the commercials are right, is going to rise dramatically. One or two more major things going wrong on the earth and look for gold to go up. Silver as well. I'm sure you've seen that one commercial where it's supposed to be $200 an ounce before too long. I doubt that. But it could go up pretty dramatically. All right, verses 15 through 17. Again, run out of time, so I'm not going to take time to read it. But you read it. This is called man's probationary period. At this juncture, his domain is the garden. After Eve got there, the thing expanded a little bit. He's given a job. Now, what do we think of as paradise? What is the perfect existence? No job. No job. Well, that's not what the Bible says. 
Man was made to have a job. Man was made to work. We think of no pain, no sweat, no noxious weeds, no thorns, no stifling heat. And he didn't even have a mother-in-law. Uh-oh, some of you are, oh, did he malign mother-in-law? I had, because of a divorce in the family, and glorious family, two mothers-in-law, and they were excellent. They were so good to me, I couldn't believe it. He didn't even have that, however. But life so prolific had to be controlled. What would you do if you could do anything you wanted to do? It might not be good. So a man is given some things to control him. Control always, necessarily must always be dictated by command, by order, by rules. Up until I was about 60 years old, I played pickup hockey. Pick up hockey, a bunch of guys getting together, and you don't have a referee. And Brett and I would go up to uh, Inkster normally, three or four different places through the years, and we would play. And it would get pretty rough. I mean, fights would break out and everything. Usually, the fights that broke out, since there were no referees, everybody was on their honor to keep the rules. And if some guy would trip you, or cross check you, or give you an elbow to the face, and there was no one to call it, that was not considered to be cricket. It wasn't even hockey. You had to have a code of honor. And sometimes it got broken. And a fight would break out. All right, a code of honor. Well, they didn't have honor. And so there was a rule. There was control, a chain of command, an assignment. Life in perfect paradise is not a lack of work. It's not just being idle. It's service, it's assignment, it's accountability. You say, in the millennium, what's gonna happen? They're gonna be work. You're going to serve. You're gonna have a job description. Well, what about in eternity? Won't we be just lying on a couch eating grapes? No, we won't. We will be working. We will be giving a responsibility. We will rule the stars, according to the Bible. But we'll be in heaven all the time, won't we? No, you'll be on assignment a lot of the time. And then come back to home base. That is what is going to happen. Don't have time to get into it. His servants shall serve him, Revelation 22, 3. And part of the assignment will be guarding, keeping the garden. Keeping the garden. Barnhouse, who taught at Moody Bible Institute and wrote on the subject, says this, and in the garden there will be no real enemies except the serpent, perhaps fallen angels. You remember they're down here? They have fallen from heaven, one third of them. Lucifer convinced that they ought to revolt with him. Fallen angels, that could happen. Pre-Adamic race, some folks believe that. They could still be around outside the garden. But at the very least, man has a stewardship responsibility, at the most an obligation to put his life on the line for his God-given domain. And part of what he's given is a woman, is a woman. Part of what we've been given is a domain. What is it? Our household. Our household. What is it? Men or women? I mean, if you're attacked out on the street, you don't run behind her, she runs behind you, I hope. A country. That's why we're not pacifists. We've been given a country, and together we band together and we defend that country. And under certain circumstances, in order to protect our domain, whether it be a, a woman, our family, our home, our country, we'll kill in order to carry that out. We're capable of killing. And when we do, and when it's overtly attacked, it is not wrong. 
it is right. You know, one of my frustrations in reading the Bible as I read the book of the Revelation is when the Lord comes back, Battle of Armageddon. And I've got a sermon on that that frustrates me every time I read it because as I read it and as I read the book of the Revelation, we're not fighting. I've always enjoyed a good fight. We're not fighting. What are we doing? We're coming back and we're cheering. Go get them, Lord. Well, I like that. I want to cheer for the right side. And I'm certainly going to cheer for the Lord in that situation. But wouldn't you just like to strike a blow or two yourself, kind of help them out just a little bit? Not going to happen. Not going to happen. But we are to guard. We are to guard. Pastor is supposed to guard the church. Do you believe that? And yet the congregation, whenever it's necessary for the pastor to do something to guard the church, they're going to say, what a meanie. Why is he doing that? It's his job. That's why he's doing it. I watched my grandfather one time drive about a dozen hyper-Calvinists out of the church. And he had people kind of looking at him, but, you know, he was running almost 5,000 then. So, you know, a dozen, eh, we can recover from that very. If we had two or three here spreading that kind of stuff, it would create a theological nightmare. And so it has to be nipped in the bud. And whose job is that? Not mine anymore. Praise the Lord. It's Brett's. Protect it. Protect theology. Protect the scripture. Protect your testimony. Protect your family. Protect the garden. Whatever garden God has given you to guard. And then it says, Thou shalt not eat. Thou shalt not eat. Because of the possibility of sin. Why did God do this? I mean, if he just hadn't put that tree there, there wouldn't have been any possibility of sin. Why did he do that? The restraint, I believe, was to test man's love and test man's obedience and give God a rationale to bless man or to punish man. True love is based on fidelity, trust, and choice. Fidelity, that is faithfulness to one another, Trust, you don't have to worry about when your husband or wife are out doing something, maybe even traveling out of the state on business or whatever, that something's going to happen that shouldn't happen. Choice, choice. I choose this woman. I choose this man. And they're the ones that I'm going to focus on and nobody else in certain venues. Well, in the garden, when Adam said to Eve, baby, you're the only girl in the world for me, she was the only girl in the world for him. Wasn't anything else he could do. Did he deserve credit for that? Not if there's only one. Honey, I've never even looked at another woman. No, there was not another woman to look at or for. He's not going to pull a Judah. What did Judah do? He went out and engaged in some hanky-panky. There's no hanky-panky possible. Without the possibility of error, how can right action be rewarded? It was like a friend, again, turning his house over. How are you going to reward him? Are you going to give him something if he stays out of the closet? Well, I might. I might throw a little bonus his way. But it's going to be a problem if he gets into the closet. All right, you do this, and thou shalt surely die. Thou shalt surely die. And I'm going to have to end with this. Liberals say the Bible messed up here. Why? Because on the day that you do it, you're going to die, and he did it, and he didn't die that day. Therefore, the Bible messed up. Or, only way to get around it, they say, is to make a thing a the day a thousand year period. The day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. Make it a thousand year period, therefore the earth was created in six thousand years. And God rested for a thousand years. 
There are two types of death. One is bodily death. which separates the soul and spirit from the body. And the other is spiritual death, the separation of soul and spirit from God. Death, death is not insensibility. It's not permanent comatoseness, if that's a word. Death is separation. And Adam died spiritually that day and consequently because of that, because of the gene pool being affected, because of what else we've talked about today, you were born dead. Well, that seems odd, but you were born dead. Alive physically, dead spiritually, until you are quickened and made alive by a process that we call regeneration, making you live again. You were born estranged, alien, godless, hopeless, Christless, condemned, crossways with God, an enemy of God, unreconciled. And you need to be reconciled to God. He needs to be made happy with you again. And you can only do that one way. The only solution is to get someone who was alive and was perfect and died and then conquered death and then provided it for you. That's the only way you can have it. And you can get it, of course. Well, I got material left here. I didn't get to where I wanted to get to. We'll maybe quickly cover it next week and then move on to subsequent chapters. All right, you may be dismissed.